Hi, Shiv and Aarti. I'm delighted uh, to be in conversation with both of you on the theme of science fiction, uh, a genre we haven't adequately explored in in our country. Uh, but before we dive into you know what the, what what that might uh, why that might be the case, I'm sure like me, the audience is extremely curious about how. Uh, you both forayed into science fiction. You know what drew you to it. So, Ships, perhaps uh, you can go first and take us through your journey so far, from Lucknow to Seattle, uh, from being a radio jockey to writing your first uh, dystopian cyberpunk novel, Dome Child, and to being also nominated uh, for Hugo and Nebula Awards, which are the most prestigious awards in science fiction uh, writing. So, how did this journey in science fiction come about, Ship? Oh, that's quite the question. Um, okay, short version. I just never really stopped. Like when you're a kid, you read lots of stories about magic and science fiction, and we have no problem giving those kind of stories to kids. And at some age, like it's like you're an adult. Stop reading these things. And I never really got that message. So it just continued. And then, like I was doing my day job. I was working in radio and stuff. And on the side, I was writing a story because of a couple of things that were interested in me. I was like particularly interested in like the rights of robots at that time in terms of like society and so on and so forth. And I wrote a short story, which turned into a book, which I didn't know what to do with. So I sent into a website and the website was Penguin. They bought it. So long story short, yeah, lots of luck, lots of whatever. I just never stopped doing what I enjoyed basically. That's that sounds great, uh, Shiv. And Aarti, uh, we're meeting for the first time, so it's lovely, lovely to, uh, uh, lovely to meet you. Uh, you were uh, a computer scientist. Uh, sorry, you were a computer science student at IIT Kanpur, and and then you went to Microsoft in Seattle. So there's a Seattle connection there, and yes. then to studying film direction and making your first science fiction feature film, Cargo, which uh, Shruti mentioned, which is really interesting and unusual offering coming from Bollywood. Uh, about an uh, immigration office in space for dead people. Mm -hmm. So please, uh, please tell us about this really fascinating and unconventional uncon journey uh, of yours. Um, uh, I think, yeah, it all probably the roots of it are in the childhood. I was always very excited. I mean, I had a lot of love for Indian mythology and fantasy stories a lot, lot. So I guess, uh, and I used to participate in a lot of story writing competitions as a kid. So, you know, it's something that I al that always stayed with me, but because I had a, middle class Nagpur upbringing so where you are like you know you have to do studies and stuff and then because I was sort of good in studies it was obvious that I wouldn't be pursuing anything around art but I would be pursuing things around science and that's how I um, went to uh, IITs that I did my you know uh, so I studied computer science engineering programming but I guess I always had that in me I've always had that sense of expression about that being a storyteller and the, even though everything was fantastic and Microsoft and it was a great job and like everything was amazing but uh, I felt a sense of that like you know that I'm not I, I felt that like you know I could pour my soul in my work mm -hmm. but uh, and uh, and at least the programming aspect of it was not really demanding my soul as much but it's super creative and I, I actually quite enjoyed programming per se right. and I gifted myself a video camera at that point and that's when I started shooting stuff from there and I just discovered this medium of expression that was amazing like and I could really feel that that's a new language and uh, that's such a beautiful language and why not learn that better so I just decided to go to a film school and and there all my windows in my brain opened because that was the first time I was exposed to you know so much art and philosophy and right. you know everything composition music everything so it kind of changed my yeah and, and there was no looking back after that so yeah <laughs> it's amazing that's that's really encouraging it you know a lot of a lot of uh, students who study science kind of get stuck there thinking yeah. that that's you know that's the career they'll have to play yeah. but, you know hearing stories like yours uh, would hopefully encourage others to also take slightly more unconventional and, yeah. and riskier uh, paths. So thank you both, first of all, for sharing your uh, your journey. I am sure that, I mean, even though it was very brief, I'm sure uh, the journey has been long and, and bumpy. With a lot of, <laughs> yeah. uh, and bumpy. So, um, so, you know, I, of course, I would admit that I, I really don't know much about science fiction. I think I read, um, uh, even I just read, a lot of science fiction books as fiction. 
and uh, and so I was also kind of you know to prepare for this interview, I was reading a lot about you know what is science fiction, maybe kind of doing a little bit of academic type of research on that. So there's a lot of confusion about what is science fiction and how is it different from fantasy and other related genres. Um, you know, where and how do we draw the line between these genres and do we even have to draw this line in the first place? So in fact, I came across some 40 odd definitions of science fiction on Wikipedia alone. Uh, for example, uh, in, uh, Arthur C. Clarke um, said in, you know, as one of the definitions he gave was science fiction is something that could happen, but you usually wouldn't want it to. Fantasy is something that couldn't happen, though you often only wish that it could. Um, and Isaac Isimov defined science fiction as that branch of literature which deals with the reaction of human beings to changes in science and technology. And there were, of course, like, you know, 30, 40 odd uh, other definitions. Also, while Star Wars films uh, and Star Trek, uh, Trek TV uh, series take place in the exact same setting, Star Wars is classified as science fiction, oh, sorry, science fantasy and Star Trek as science fiction. Anyway, I'm not going to ask you to define science fiction. I mean, I was really confused at the end of it. So, um, but I think um, what, what I would like to understand from you is how you frame this genre and how do you make sense of it and subsequently express this through your art? And if possible, if this doesn't seem like an unreasonable question, also share what according to you definitely doesn't qualify as science fiction. You want me to go first? Anyone can, any of you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so essentially for me, uh, I see uh, my stories of science fiction in general as thought experiments. And uh, one way of really demarcating sci-fi fantasy, though I feel the lines are really blurred and, you know, in a way, I also feel that in science fiction, you try to extrapolate, you know, whatever there is. What, uh, uh, not just your technology, but also the con cultural constructs and everything. And you try to, you know, extrapolate and, you know, to, you try to come up with uh, some story. But mm -hmm. I, I'm sure Shiv will have a better answer to this. But yeah, fantasy is something where, you know, uh, it's basically more magic. Mm -hmm. Though science fiction also has magic, but you try to have a, a sort of a set of steps that can lead you to those magic. So you will have systems and processes to explain those magic. And I think that's the difference overall. But yeah, for me, it's essentially, I see both of them as very interesting thought experiments. And I think science fiction is the best way to describe reality. You know, you, when I make a science fiction, fiction film, it's not about something happening in the future. It's actually about what is happening to you and I today. So mm -hmm. I think that's the best way to, uh, and it's more enjoyable way to examine uh, reality because you let go of your biases when you see, you know, when you kind of change your perspectives yeah. on that so i think it's and i also i think it's one of the best vehicles to make your philosophical questions little storyable like if you have like cargo is like what happens after death is such a philosophical questions and you know essentially it is about that it's about us it's um uh, i think one of the best things about cargo someone said it's about just departures and it's not just departures after death but departures because when you leave your friend and when you leave a relationship so you know it is about that so essentially it is about you and i yeah so yeah essentially it's that very interesting perspective yeah. uh i think yeah. shiv what are your thoughts you're you're on mute you're um i think you started pretty much from where i tend to be on this topic which is that there's so many definitions it's like opinions right everyone has to um, um <laughs> uh, the one that I like a lot, I don't remember who it's by, but it's it's the one that says a science fiction story is one that if you were to remove the science from the story, it would be unable to continue to exist as a story. Mm. So, which is interesting, but then there's a, the other part of this is like, since you brought up Arthur C. Clarke, he has a really good line. And my favorite thing that he ever came up with was the, one of the more interesting things he came up with was the thing where he said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic which kind of ties in quite nicely to your example of Star Wars and fantasy because mm. Star Wars actually tries to explain the ability to do Jedi magic as science. Mm. They had that whole really convoluted midichlorian experiment right. or explanation rather. And essentially the explanation failed to convince people scientifically. So now we are calling it science fantasy. 
if right. they convinced us that it was great technology, we'd probably be calling it science fiction. Right. So, like with most things, it's in the eye of the beholder. And I, I honestly feel it's one of those things where we tend to get too caught up in the weeds in this, where like these lines are getting blurred all the time, constantly, right. especially now. Mm-hmm. And then you get into stuff like what, what I'm going on and on about this, but like this is a part that I identify quite interesting, which is like what is science? So yeah, typically when you have like someone quote unquote writing science fiction, you'll have someone talking about stuff related, you know, like physics or chemistry or mathematics. Mm-hmm. But if you write something related to say economics or sociology, for some reason that won't get qualified as science fiction, even though these are sciences. All right. So, right. so like we then have to start talking about why hard sciences versus or STEM That's sciences true. versus like yeah. soft sciences or the humanities have got this, well, this line of perceptual distinction, which I don't think should exist based on the definition. Right. Yeah, that's that's another very, very interesting uh, insight and, and perspective uh, shift. So, um, on, I mean, on definitions, Christopher Evans, I just again want to just share what he uh, said about science fiction. He said science fiction is a literature of what if, what if we could travel in time, what if we were living on another planet, what if he made contact with alien races and so on. So the starting point is that the writer supposes things are different from how we know them to be. So what is, okay, so yeah, so what is your starting point and how and where do you start your science fiction writing process? Do you come up with a storyline or some key characters or a scenario or an emotional state that you might be in or are you responding to the times we are living in like Aarti kind of alluded to earlier. So just maybe kind of take us through your process of how you approach and build your science fiction story. I think that will also help us make better sense of how you frame it, um, you know, on your, on your level. So yeah, any, any of you can start. Shiv, maybe you can start this time. I think one of the better what an easier way for me to address this is actually like take a step back in the sense mm. that like we're talking a lot about science fiction and fantasy, but really like we're we're in a world today where basically people are essentially talking about all of them as speculative fiction. Mm, yeah. Which is essentially yeah. fiction that leads us to deal with speculative worlds or realities. Okay. And it includes horror, it includes science fiction, it includes fantasy, it includes humor, obviously, because everything includes humor, because that's the human state, really. So with that understanding, it becomes not so much a question of I am processing how to write a science fiction story as much as write a story because effectively, like eventually all stories are about people and mm. most speculative fiction is about stories and the ones that are set in the future, are essentially about the illusion of the future, but they're effectively talking about the world we live in today. Right. So the roundabout answer is the process essentially differs basis the story. Like mm-hmm. every time you sit down to write a story or a book, you have to first convince yourself that you still know how to do it. <laughs> right. So sometimes it begins with the character. Sometimes it begins with the thought. Sometimes it's an idea for a title. Sometimes it's, it's very hard for me to like bookend how the process works. Right, like, right. I mean, there are steps you use at a craft level, but mm-hmm. in terms of like idea generation to like visualizing final, whatever, it's, mm-hmm. it's a whole lot of like see ball, hit ball. Right. Right. Okay. Well, I, 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 I agree with Shiv, you know, the, it's, it's exactly the same. You don't know how you get an idea. And eventually I don't sit you know, saying, Oh, let me write a science fiction story. You want to just write a story. That's story. Yeah. Right. And yeah. And I mean, the way he said it is so true that sometimes something inspires you and you start weaving your story around it. And it could be anything. It could be character. It could just be a name. It could just be a visual. And mm. once you weave it, maybe the thing that started you might just go away because you weave something. But how it starts is something like you, you cannot tell what what sticks like or what kind of draws you in, in a way. So there's no way mm. to say, ki, Achha, abhi iske mein kahani Aisa hota nahi. so yeah, and I mean, I think she said it right. Like the craft level things now you've started doing because you've done it so much that you'll think of characters, there's this, this, the world and all. But when you, yeah, the starting point is something that is like, yeah, God gifted, like, yeah, whatever. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the reason why I asked this question is also because, you know, uh, for the science fiction, those who, are, who would like to participate in science fiction writing competitions or would like to take up science fiction, you know, where do they begin? How should they begin? You know, where should the inspiration come from? And I, I agree that, you know, it can come from 
different places at different times or different people. Uh, but yes, on a more on a craft level, uh, how do you approach science fiction? It might help. Like this is a weird gap to talk about, really. Like the gap between like what an idea is and what it becomes in your brain and what what it finally becomes once you worked on it. Mm-hmm. So, so like a really random example to quote from my own work is. I once had a friend who posted a really, really weird ad on social media, which was basically a TV ad from the United States in the 70s. It was called Sir Baby Laugh-A-Lot. It was just a very weird ad for a doll that kept laughing in a really creepy way. And that led me to think about killing people via laughter, which became a story about the Bengal famine. Mm. Right. So what started and what finished, like you, you can't really like draw a line between them, mm. but that's why the human brain is a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, anything else, Sarthi, from, from your side? No, no, no. I, exactly what you said is so true. Like it's, it's just, and by the time you think of an idea and by the time you finish your story is usually a year or more than a year. So it's like, there's so much happens in that. So you can't tell like, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Right, right. Sorry, I'm going to come back to science fiction or <laughs> you know, bring science back into, into our, our conversation. So in addition to these uh, kind of uh, space settings and dystopian future, you know, what are some other settings or, or tropes in science fiction that really excite you or you wish to explore in your you know, future work? Any? <laughs> Unfair question. I'm asking a dentist to talk about teeth. <laughs> yeah. I, I would let Shiva answer that question first and then <laughs> settings. Um well a lot of settings, I mean, in the sense that uh I'm gonna assume you mean the question to be essentially futuristic settings or any setting, any really any setting in science fiction. Of course, the two that I mentioned, the dystopian future setting and the space, you know, being in this out there in the space. Uh, these are settings that have been used quite often in, in, in literature and film. So what other than this, uh, you know, probably excites you or you find interesting and you want to explore? Honestly, it's hard to come up with a setting that hasn't been mm-hmm. used a lot because basically to quote Arthur Conan Doyle, like it, there's nothing new under the sun. It has all been done before. We just dress it up in new clothes every time. So what interests me is people, basically. So like mm. all my stories are about people. And I, right. it's my belief that all good stories are about people. So, mm-hmm. I mean, you could set it in space. You could set it on the moon. You could set it. Like, a lot of my stories are just set in human society, like here. So the story I'm currently working on is set in Delhi, in West Delhi, in fact. Okay. Uh, and it's there's a whole bunch of like speculative fiction in there and it deals it it's not actually science fiction it's more to do with like indian urban legends and stuff like that right. but it's that kind of setting then another piece i'm working on is set is science fiction but it's set in lucknow so okay. which is my hometown so like like form follows function really i feel so when it comes to like writing stuff so basically the setting itself is not necessarily always what will drive you as a creator to like get into the space. Like the setting sometimes becomes a function of the other idea that you wanted to explore or the right. other thought that you wanted to explore. Mm-hmm. So as someone once told me in this, in this, in this business, all rules are decided on a case to case basis. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Arti, your thoughts or. It's exactly that, that we never think of, oh, let's set a story like that. That's mm-hmm. that's not the approach I, I would like have in general. Like, we so always start with character and what is the dilemma of the character. Mm-hmm. And you come up with a what if situation around that dilemma, dilemma around that. But you really mm-hmm. don't say, chal, aaj time travel pe story banayenge. You never start like that. Mm-hmm. I think we always start with what is the central yearning of a character. And then you, you know, whatever happens around it, then you see, try to see what, how do you solve that yearning in a way. And, you know, so there are like a lot of tropes around it, but like, mm-hmm. and you know, like you can have a story on time travel, you can have story on like whatever, like, but uh, that's not uh, how I, 
and you would i mean we would approach, would approach. hello yeah. aaj chal is pe banate hain karke like we always think yaar ye bechare hamare jo characters ka problem kya hai and mm-hmm. then whatever setting flows from there it's also yeah that's like there's just a layer there's just a, you know what a uh, what we will eventually examine would be the big whatever the character is going through or whatever challenge so that's what we approach it through so not really so much as to all you know we don't yeah go setting sure, right sure sure Right. So, I mean, you both obviously work in different formats. Uh, Shiv, you're a writer, Aarti, you are a filmmaker and a screenplay writer. So how easy or difficult is it to take words on the page to creating these moving images uh, that we see on screen? And and I guess the added layer or a really large layer of challenge is that many of the characters and settings in science fiction are imaginary. Um, or oh, yeah possibly imagine so how do you bring that imagination to life so that it does justice to you know what the writer has originally imagined so what are some key challenges in bridging these two formats uh, of adapting say you know book to, to to a film and you know how do you how best can we actually overcome some of these uh, challenges i think the top challenges would be the budget challenges that we come across when we come to adapt you know so there are budget for production design and then there are budgets for vfx mm-hmm. and for the longest time the benchmark for sci-fi films were this mega blockbusters you know from uh, mm-hmm. from hollywood so for us is to how to come up with your own language of an independent uh, 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 science fiction film and there are a lot of independent looking science like another earth or you know like a lot of mm-hmm. very cool films which don't resort to this big budget so is essentially sci-fi sci-fi per se is the biggest challenge is the uh, uh, vfx okay. and the production design but also yeah i mean over a period of time you also acquire that you understand that not everything you write you will be able to film and you know mm-hmm. you also acquire some understanding of how much something will cost and accordingly you also write your scripts such that you will be able to achieve it but essentially it is the action the production design and vfx that has always these three legs are much tougher and also i think it's also you know in science fiction when you uh, 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 when you uh, for example if you you decide something about the world then you cannot crack you, that world cannot have cracks so you have to choose your locations accordingly so th- everything has to be given if you see all science fiction there will be a common language throughout so you know those things so they that way it almost becomes like you know how the amount of efforts that goes into a period piece is the amount of efforts that will go into science fiction film because right. you are rethinking every prop you are rethinking everything right. so it's actually a more involved process of making it it's mm. and it also that's why it is also enjoyable that way so yeah so that's how it is interesting yeah that's an interesting comparison also with with period drama because you also have to imagine a lot of things mm-hmm. uh, in that case uh, shiv uh, what about you what are your thoughts on this i mean I, of course you're not a filmmaker but you know what are your general thoughts on book adaptations it's just different writing like it's writing mm. for a different medium so you're just writing it differently for the sense that um, the real problem or the real challenge for a writer of mm-hmm. like prose as opposed to like writing for film is that you you lose all interiority for the most part right like mm-hmm. you're dependent on an actor to represent everything that is happening within the character and mm-hmm. that actor is probably going to do it in the form of like a facial expression so a you have to trust that the actor is doing it b you have to trust that the actor is good enough that it's getting across and resonating with the audience and see that mm-hmm. it's happening in a fashion that is actually like demonstrating what you want to like put in that space right. so So it's much more visual writing. Like, for instance, when I used to write for radio, it's just like an adaptation in the sense. Like, when you write for radio, you're writing much more in a much more quote unquote audio fashion, mm. where you are essentially finding ways to audioify or audioize or whatever the word is for things that you would possibly like use as interior thoughts in prose. Mm-hmm. And when you're writing for for the screen, you're essentially like finding a way to visualize them. Right. So. So basically you're touching on different beats and places and you're like emphasizing them differently. So it's just it's like working with oil paint versus like other kinds of paint versus mm. so on and so forth. It's just like a different version of writing really. Right, 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 right. Um so I mean a lot of questions are actually trickling in but um let me so a lot of uh, English sci-fi books have been adapted to films 
and uh, and correct me if i'm wrong very rarely do you find uh, original screenplay for a science fiction feature film cargo of course being an exception there uh, so why why do you think that is the case uh, why is wh- why do we not use original screenplays and generally go for book adaptations no so in west there was this massive sci-fi wow. fan base so a lot mm. of books that were adapted were also already very popular right so right. that's why the a lot of earlier the so much philip k dick was adapted by you know students and then they showed some success right they were so popular in general so that's how it is because see the, the us concept is very the eastern sci-fi and western sci-fi are two very different worlds different things, yeah. like you know the us guys are crazy they have this strong fan base they will have this culture also since since their child, kids mm. they are you know consuming it so that's very different uh, but also now i guess off late lot of independent uh, writing is also happening because there's like this content explosion that's happening but initially of course like you know most of the time it's like oh my god i'm such a huge fan of blade runner like you know why not mm-hmm. like you know so you know things like that like uh, i guess that's why um, i mean that those are the fan uh, fan boys like you know, they had like such a they're already so popular that they are, so that's how it started that way like, very true very true mm-hmm. and i mean and how can we like perhaps promote more original screenplay writing if if you know if, are are generally producers uh, brave enough are they in 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 bollywood or in indian cinema um, forget about original non original i don't know if bollywood even makes science fiction that way that like much. the genre yeah. itself is bollywood is not genre uh, you know very genre friendly as such oh. so uh, yeah i mean yeah i don't know shiv has something to add yeah yeah uh, I- Well I think the business of filmmaking is fairly genre agnostic in a lot of ways in the sense mm-hmm. that like the analog in India is not so much like the way like artists complete like when she talks about science fiction having this huge and spec fic having this huge fan base out west but mm-hmm. it's just pretty much an an analog to that is like crime fiction in India where like mm-hmm. everyone every every other crime novel is getting adapted into some form of screenplay and some kind of film because right. the crime book has an audience which right. exists the crime film has an audience that exists the filmmakers know that people will go to the cinema to watch it right. they will tune into netflix so at the end of the day producers are in the business of filmmaking because they love making money through films hmm. as opposed to they love making films at the cost of their own money right right and so at the end of the day, it's a business decision so like if as an audience you want more science fiction the best way to do is to like show the producers and the people who are putting down and signing the checks that hey you will show up for the movie right yeah so i mean science fiction and literature and cinema that we know today is uh, largely uh, a western genre of course i mean it is evolving in the country and, and you know we there's something called indian science fiction uh, that's uh, uh coming to the fore but and arthi of course your f- film cargo has elements of science fiction and also elements of indian magical folk tales and mythology and uh, but uh, i'm not sure if, like you know arthi you said that fiction is still not as popular in our country as other genres are so what are some barriers to making science fiction more accessible and more popular in india so that it catches the imagination of a much larger section of of society in in you know in our country uh because only like she was saying only when uh it becomes more lucrative uh, genre will the publishers and film production houses uh, will will back it and i guess on similar lines it would also be useful to know what are some critical challenges or barriers for pursuing science fiction work in our country uh, that you may have encountered in your respective fields of work and if these challenges somewhere also kind of feed into uh the barriers of making science fiction more accessible or popular rather yeah i know the typical barrier is in a way when you want to do science fiction in india you will be sort of the you, the challenges you will face would be the chi- challenge any pioneer would face because mm. you know you are trying to do something that nobody has done before so and that's true for any field that if you're trying to do something that's not mainstream you mm. will be you will have to uh, fight through a lot of things like for something like interstellar to exist 
2001 st- space odyssey existed like 60 years back like you know and they have like that's why that science fiction is like it's part of their dna Hmm. What you would be trying to do is would be starting from like making the first science fiction film or the second science fiction film. So the barriers of do early entrance or anybody who starts something new will always have those kind of barriers. And as I said earlier, that the biggest was that obviously that Indian audience is exposed to this massive big budget Hollywood film. So you hmm. know, for you to make a science fiction film, it's like becomes a typical that chicken and egg problem that you know mm-hmm. for you to make it, you will require that amount of budget, but you will not have it because for a producer, he would be unsure if that will work or not. So you know, so yeah. you have to basically gradually reach at a point where like your stories are exciting. You yourself has developed that confidence, uh, you know that. that body of work that a producer feels confident to trust you with your stories yeah. and you also figure out a way to crack stories and crack the language this is truly Indian and what mm-hmm. you spoke about right so there's this whole western science fiction and instead of Indian science fiction I would also say there's an Asian science fiction mm-hmm. which is like I think the Asian sci-fi will be adapted better to you know our stories if we if I make something like a completely space film Hmm. And if I have make something like a moon, like nobody will see yeah, two people in a spaceship, why will I see? But in hmm. US, moon is like such an indie hit. In yeah. India, it will be massive flop. Like So in hmm. India, if you want to make something like that, you will have to fill it with something that is Asian culturally. Because culturally, yeah. also we are very different from, you know, uh, 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 than a Western, you know, where the concept ours is like cha-cha, mama, what's up, all this hmm. is there. And there, there's like a lone, like, you know, like Superman is a typical metaphor of an immigrant, like, you know, so right. it's a very different uh, thing. So we have to come up with your own uh, uh, sort of uh, story that is rooted, that can be popular. And it's an, of course, an uphill battle, but it's okay, like, I guess. And we are lucky right now, we're in a time where there's a content uh, explosion. So we can try and do things. And there are people who are open to it a so little bit now, like, as opposed to like five years ago, where everybody was close to it completely. So. That's 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 very encouraging. I'm just saying, if you want to tie all of this into a knot that will make nobody particularly happy, mm-hmm. um, one way to do it is like to point out that when superhero movies became really popular, including in India, the response of Bollywood was to start making Krish movies. Krish. <laughs> now you could argue, the, the, Krish is pretty much science fiction. Now you can argue about how good it is or bad it is, but it is a thing. Yeah, And... There were three of them, if I remember correctly, or more, mm. like they kept multiplying. It was like a virus. Um, so, so a filmmaker will do it. Like people will put money into things if they think there is an audience for it. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's really that simple. And in terms of like adaptation, like Krish was very much the desified version of like the Western solo superhero, which is another mm. point out like a whole cultural thing. Right. And mm. like, for instance, China is doing some great work in science fiction right now. So okay. A lot of Chinese science fiction stories are actually getting adapted into films in the West now. Uh, most common being The Three Body Problem, which was a fantastic book. And right. I'm quite excited. I haven't seen the I, film, I'm, but. Yeah, I'm very excited about it. Yeah. I'm a huge uh, Louis Fiction fan. Which kind of like relates to your first question in a way. So, mm-hmm. Chinese science fiction is a huge thing because it is the one way in which a writer who is a dissident within China can criticize the Chinese government mm-hmm. because. Because now you're talking about a world which is not China and does right. not exist and not your government. Right. But it is. <laughs> yeah, that's that's very interesting. So, so uh, I guess as someone who is in science and is more specifically in science communication for public understanding, I can't help but ask this question. I mean, what do you think is the influence of science fiction on public understanding of science and also on the perception public perception or attitude towards science so in short uh, can science fiction get people interested in science uh, or help start a conversation on a you know on a science and technology related matter uh, yeah and yeah yeah so do you know in china they had done an experiment they wondered why uh, uh, like in china while they are making so many companies why all the companies are not original and why all the original companies are happening in US 
Hmm. And uh, they concluded that like it happens only because uh, they were uh, they the kids there consume science fiction like Elon Musk for example is a huge I mean of course one can debate <laughs> Elon Musk that's such but he's a huge uh, science fiction fan and you know a lot of them were so their windows were open to innovate so they actually in China they had done a massive conference and they had con- called all the top sci-fi writers including that's Neil right. Gaiman and all to come and right. take talk and that's why they actually started funding sci-fi writing and sci-fi writers a lot so there's a government level they did that because they wanted the next generation to have original you know to have pioneer uh, like sort of have original thinkers and original innovators so right. in science because that kind of fueled it like reading science fiction fueled it so it is it is for sure and and of course those people have done studies with proper phd so yeah, yeah. so yeah Very interesting Yeah. Shiv, what what do you think? There's umpteen examples of this actually, like both ways. Uh, mm. A fun one, which so the fun one is actually based on a misconception, is the Asimov one, of course. Where uh, so Asimov was writing about something called robotics long before robotics ever existed. So which has led to the misconception that Asimov actually had something to do with the development mm. of robotics, mm. which he did not. What happened was that people were working in a field that didn't have a name, who happened to be from the same campus as Asimov, reading yeah. his newsletter, and decided to use the word. So, in that sense, there was an influence. Hmm. Um, I actually think that the stuff we talked about at the beginning, in terms of like society and and the way people look at each other and look at the world around them, as opposed to the technology around them, is where science fiction has a way larger influence. So for instance a whole lot of modern anti climate change like or climate climate denialism can be traced back to a book called the state of fear by michael crichton yeah. which is it's an awful book right like uh, but most of the terrible arguments you will find that people making against climate change you will find in some form distilled for public use in that book mm. so it's not a lot to like basically push ideas that have proven to be detrimental in the long term so does science fiction influence people yes is that always a good thing not necessarily mm. so the idea as someone working in the field is to try and be like someone whose work is not quoted in the way michael crichton is being quoted now right <laughs> so uh, i have there are a lot of questions in the q and a box i'm just going to uh, read them out so there's a question for you arti uh, science fiction is like extrapolation of the present in terms of tech and cultural things more so like a future world or even the reality how common are sci-fi movies about past do they even exist as the science was lesser in past and common knowledge now i uh, know uh, sci-fi can exist in past you can there are so many time travel stories around that and uh, uh, you know and of course uh, Uh, not everything is about what happens in the future there can be magic science something happening in fu- in the past that influence today and doesn't exist so there are not common but there are a lot of science fiction stories set in the past and they are one of the some of the best stories like you know that are set in the past so in fact a good science fiction story would be in past present future like you know they would be in all three places yeah. uh chief uh, do you have I mean, anything to add past, yeah right like time travel stories are the perfect example like um so one of the most common tropes or sub tropes in science fiction it's not one i'm particularly fond of but it's like the it's called the baby hitler conundrum mm-hmm. which is that old question of like if you had a time machine and went back and killed baby hitler what would change in the world could you like save so many people and stop this and stop that and mm-hmm. it's a fundamentally flawed question at a lot of levels but it is a question that tons of stories have explored mm-hmm. and for some reason there is also this huge There are a lot of time travel stories involving dinosaurs for some reason. Like people really like the idea of dinosaurs, which is understandable. They really like the yeah. idea of time travel, which is understandable. And these two tend to marry a lot. There are mm. lots of award-winning stories about dinosaurs. One, I think it was the Robert Sawyer story. I forget the name, but it is about a dinosaur which is given the mind of a criminal from mm. the modern age, and what happens. in that situation where if you give a violent criminal the body of a tyrannosaurus rex like what damage does that person now do right wow oh. okay interesting yeah shift sorry you were saying something i mean so yeah so the short answer is time travel is the answer mm-hmm. and 
to come back to it like i keep going back to this like science fiction is not about predicting the future it is about mm. interpreting the present through the guise of the future so there's a lot of past there's a lot of present and there's a whole lot more of both of these than there is the future actually <laughs> we got another panelist um so <laughs> yeah Uh, so there's a, there's a question for uh, shiv so to uh, shiv your point about perceptual lines between stem and humanities economics bitcoin or cryptocurrency currencies in general are blurring those lines how is science fiction tackling or adapting uh, adapting it oh, good question multiple ways i would say like for instance the fact that so a whole lot of a whole lot of this actually comes from a few science fiction stories to start with and more to the point a lot of what you're going to start seeing over the next few years because the topic is becoming so important to us is climate change and here's something that people who are into cryptocurrencies and stuff don't like hearing this part of it but for instance nfts nfts are terrible for the environment like at a climate level so you're going to see a whole lot of stories in the next few years i predict which tell you about the bad things that happened to the world because of run on effects of cryptocurrency mm. i don't know if this is the answer you wanted to hear but i'm unfortunately here to tell you that this is what is going to be happening yeah because again i keep coming back to this technology works for society in real life and in fiction so it will become the medium to explore a societal problem or a world problem or a people problem yeah 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 arti do any, any do you want to add anything no okay uh, so there's another question there actually a lot of questions coming in so let me see how many i can uh, screen and shruti is helping me so which issues and topics in science fiction are you seeing authors engage with currently as judged from coming book releases what are some popular themes i i don't know uh, for me as what uh, shiv said was more than themes i am really uh, very excited to consume lot of asian science fiction because i'm very keen on uh, seeing this because science fiction as such had been dominated by western voices i think for me what is exciting is the new stories because they are going beyond the existing tropes or themes and they are so layered and it is mm-hmm. also so emotional and so character driven so i am very excited about all the asian sci-fi as such but i'm sure like she could also speak about more like you know as what is more happening yeah so yeah mm-hmm. I'm sorry sir you actually cut out when you were asking the question so I didn't catch all of it So uh so the question is which issues and topics in science fiction are you seeing authors engage with currently as as judged from upcoming book releases Oh um so I'm not particularly qualified to speak of upcoming book releases per se because I'm not a publisher or an agent or anything of that sort so there's a limit to how much i can talk about in terms of like what people have shared with me like at a personal yeah. level but like yeah. uh essentially the societal issues that you see around you or the issues like writers are people they like essentially see the same things you do they just like mm-hmm. you know they tend their job is kind of like tell stories about it so like i said climate change is something that a lot of you see uh something else you see a lot of is like explorations of like the justice system criminal justice system stuff like police brutality mm-hmm. stuff like you know racism the gap between the talk of wanting diversity and the actual action of having diversity on the ground the gaps between the haves and the have nots in our world like inequalities mm-hmm. so in some ways the same things we've been talking about for a really long time because we've we managed to find ways to not change these things even though we keep pointing them out in different ways for hundreds of years yeah. so as conan doyle said there is nothing new under the sun it has all been done before we are dressing it in new clothes <laughs> right um so there's a question about what is the relationship between proper science with science fiction uh so there are movies like martian and there are also superhero movies like avengers but martian makes you think that this is plausible you know what is happening in the movies plausible whereas uh, these avengers movie obviously 
same fantasies. So I guess maybe how science is, is used or depicted and how plausible is the science that is shown in the films. Uh, the so origins, it's also, oh, so sorry, Shiv, you can answer. No, 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 no this is, I, 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 would, I would like to hear what you say on this. No, 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 no. I, I think the origin itself is very different. The origin of Avengers is of Marvel comics, which is very different. And the origin of Martian is science fiction, which is very different. So right. it's like apples and oranges, especially Avengers and comparing uh, Martian in a way, because Avengers is a blockbuster. It's a, you know, it's a very different uh, altogether. And it's roots are very different. It's root right. is uh, that graphic novel. It's root is nothing related to science fiction. It's more fantasy this action this it's like the that's a very different culture very different um, fan base also like in right. general so that's there and uh, maybe the question is more about like how do you uh, see martian still is like very clearly showing that it is a reality right avengers yeah. is you're talking about hulk or it's a very different uh, very fantastical yeah story, yeah so in a way uh, uh, i think the difference they ask is how close the science is for both. It's like maybe Martian have is more research oriented and they will work harder to get their terms right and this right and the logic right and stuff. In Avengers, they would not really care so much about it, you know. Uh, but yeah, essentially it's that. But I think they're very different. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Very yeah. different type of films. Shiv, you were saying something as well. Yeah. I mean, this is a particularly it's a particularly interesting example, like the two examples that have been cited here. Uh, mm. There's a lot to cover, but in quick terms, like Avengers, like is actually a good example in terms of our previous question we were talking about, because superhero comics essentially are a response to policing in society and the concept of vigilantism. And can you trust the police to do their job? No, we cannot, which is why superheroes exist. That's and right. then you have all these questions about how, in a sense, they are a a look at rich people policing the rest of society because they have the resources. So let's park that concept, but there's a whole lot there to unpack to start with. Mm. Um, when it comes to the Martian, okay, I'm going to take that last. Uh, these lines are, lines are also blurred in a lot of ways because, all right, so take a book like the fifth season, which is ostensibly a fantasy trilogy. And it's a fantastic trilogy. Like uh, mm. the Broken Earth trilogy, like strongly recommend everyone read it. Like it talks about, the criminal justice system in very in fairly direct ways actually it right. talks about racism it talks about a whole lot of things and it does so through rock people and the geology in that book you will not find a geologist to tell you they will find one thing wrong like it's perfect geology but mm. it's effectively a fantasy series mm. so you don't have to write pure science quote unquote science fiction to do good science one mm. like most good writers will set their fantasy stories somewhere and they will make sure that, you know, like your, your physical characteristics, etc., scientifically make sense. Like right. if someone has like a fictional place with two moons, they will, if they're doing a good job, like affect the tides and so on and so forth yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Come back to the Martian now, which is a very interesting thing. Cause like what exactly is plausible? Like the science may be plausible, but I, to flip the question, I ask you, based on everything you have seen of the world, do you find it plausible that a person would be lost in space and they would spend millions of dollars to save that life? Hmm. Because I don't see it happening in the real world we live in. So you hmm. might question how realistic the Martian was to begin with, hmm. because most cases they would be like, that's tragic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's, a, that's a good point. I think the, the premise is quite unrealistic. Um, right. So then maybe we'll, uh, we're almost, we're almost at the end of this session. So I think there's a question from someone who is saying, what is the best route for an independent science fiction firm to reach the audience as studios and distribution houses? I, I don't know. Yeah. Are we worthy of this new genre? Um, I think for me, I lucked out because I had interest from Netflix mm. and, uh, and it came and it was a worldwide release. So I think I just sort of lucked out. It's just such a case by case basis. I don't know if I luck out with my next film. It's like, you know, the people there, they, at that point, they liked it. So they chose to program it. 
you know it's right. that's the thing like you just have to make it um, i think for me what really helped was the south by southwest and we were in 25 festivals right. and so the fact that you know there were a lot of this nomination that nomination also the fact that also i have my actors vikrant masi and shweta tripathi are like one of the you know at least in the ott era vikrant masi is the most popular actor out there the mirzapur was also coming from yeah. amazon so netflix had a response for the mirzapur in terms of cargo so yeah. it just like it was you know we just lucked out at that point right so uh, you know so it's combination of casting and the festival selection that helped us uh, right. in a way yeah so okay. yeah. all right so there's one an- another question which i also had was you know can science fiction serve as a reservoir of speculative ideas and wild imaginations that actually scientists can draw from and apply to their work because this has happened i mean with the work that we've seen previous work that we've seen in science fiction about new technologies and and new kind of futures um which are reality today so but you know what are your thoughts on uh, on whether science fiction can influence scientific research and innovation today arti you i think you're on mute yeah no no i was thinking i let shiv answer that post i would say yeah yeah this question is for shiv actually i uh, also in the... <laughs> it's an interesting question in in one sense a little chicken and egg because um a lot of people who write science fiction are interested in reading up on science a lot of people who read up on science also read science fiction mm. where one starts and where one look so an idea that becomes a scientific theory or an idea that becomes a story may possibly come from a similar place they may possibly not um if i'm reading the same question you are there's a bit about time travel i can confidently tell you that no story about time travel is going to help us develop a time machine i can promise <laughs> you that so right that's not going to happen so did the concept of people working on a time machine exist before hg wells hell yeah like mm. people have been trying to build time machines for a really, really long time so yeah. i think science fiction honestly is a better way a better way to look at it in terms of it's not it's not telling scientists or showing scientists hey look this is an idea you can now like go and right. create yeah you are more likely to learn what scientists are doing on the cutting edge of science when you read science fiction because your authors are pulling ideas from research from that there. is happening yeah, or thoughts yeah. that are happening and building stories around them right, so right. i think one of the best examples of this is crispr you know mm-hmm. gene the genome gene gene editing stuff and there's some really really fascinating stuff in there there's a whole bunch of stories then sounds like science fiction but most of them are basically based on pretty much cutting edge research and study that is happening right now mm. and i know a whole bunch of people who have learned about it via the medium of stories for the first time so my short answer would be science fiction can help you learn what is happening in science probably more accurately than science fiction will help you predict what is going to happen in science yeah that's a that's a great response arti you want to add i think shiv had a lovely answer like that's yeah. true as a science fiction person i do read up a lot about science and i know a lot of people who are passionate about science and are on the edge of it will also do consume a lot of science fiction so there is a lot of cross pollination so yeah but like, yeah, as you said like nobody will make a time machine because they read a yeah time travel story i mean i think yeah i think she answered it well yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Put it this way: If you can figure out how to make a time travel, like a time machine, don't waste it on a story. Patent that thing and make your money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so well, Shruti has asked me to to request you for some final words uh, uh, to encourage more science fiction writers for the competition that India Science Festival is uh, hosting. So, any any final words from from both of you on? or advice for science aspiring science fiction writers filmmakers i'm just waiting for shiv to <laughs> <laughs> i mean all i'll say is that this is one of the most like unharnessed fields you can like play in because 
essentially the entirety of human imagination is your oyster there is nothing you cannot do when you're working in speculative fiction you don't have to worry about whether your character can fly and why how long it will take him to walk from mumbai to delhi to in order to have that conversation you don't have to worry about any of that stuff mm. you can make it work and you can work in the realm of ideas and that's a nice really really fun place to be as a creator where physics are not a limiting factor it's it's what science is trying to get us to hmm. so you get yeah. to pretend we've got there and what could be more fun than that yeah, yeah absolutely i think and uh, yeah i mean since shiv spoke about the science fiction part of it i would uh, want to go back to what also he said in the beginning that we when we start we always start with the character and their story so do hmm. while you do that always think about the character don't get too much caught up in the i mean of course world building is always exciting but what your character's journey through that world is something that is most exciting for anyone reading your science fiction story so yeah okay. brilliant thank you so much both of you uh, for patiently answering all the questions and and uh, yeah i i you know i had i really enjoyed uh, hearing your thoughts and i really look forward to seeing your work and also uh, more work in science fiction and also to see how this genre evolves over you know the next couple of years in a a decade in india and hopefully india science festival can play a small load role in encouraging more science fiction uh writing and storytelling in india so with that thank you uh thanks a lot uh, shiv and aarti for for joining this session and i hope uh, uh you know the audience uh, had a had a good time and uh, and see you all at the festival in january and uh, stay tuned thank you